You are listening to Zeal Fear House. I am your host, David Murray, and I'm joined with Dorothy Carruthers. Her focus here is on our relationship with our Heavenly Dad and all aspects of His Kingdom, moving in greater intimacy with Him. Additional teachings, books, and articles may be found on my website at www.dwmurray.com. That's dwmurry.com. Again, thanks for joining us, and let's get rolling with this week's broadcast. Well, good evening. This is David Murray. I'm joined with Dorothy Carruthers on Blog Talk Radio, The Portal. This is Zeal for Your House. Uh, Welcome. Uh, Dorothy, I know I said I'm going to jump right into this tonight, and that's my goal, guys, is to keep this message under a half hour and to get you guys um, some milk and meat of the word that will bless you. I'm going to try to, one of the things that the Lord has been impressing upon me in this season is to really minister to those that are desiring more, uh, that want more from the Lord. They want greater intimacy and a greater relationship. This series is Deeper Communion, Deeper Communion Series. Uh, we're continuing on with that. It's Understanding His Government. Uh, it, this message If you are not looking to grow deeper in your walk, this message is not for you. If you are not looking at how to interact in the spirit realm, what it's like to live like the first century Christians did and the way Jesus did, if that is not interested to you, this message is not going to be for you. Uh, This message is for those that want to interact in the realm of the spirit. They want to move on the earth as Jesus did. They want to have interactions with Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and with the ministering spirits that are in God's kingdom. Um, That's what we're going to jump into. So what we're going to be talking about, well, David, what does this have to do with understanding his government? How does understanding his government help us in intimacy? Well, glad you asked. Because what we're going to be talking about is in order to Move in greater intimacy, guys. We have to first understand the nature of God. The reason why we have to understand this is because the kingdom of heaven is a real place. It is not it is fluffy cloud. You know, if we ever stop and thought, like right, a lot of us are talking about, you know, the millennial reign and Christ's return and and uh, the kingdom of heaven. But I don't hear a lot of talk on what this kingdom is actually about. When Jesus comes and rules upon the earth, uh, and when the angelic host and when the saints of God come in their glorified bodies to rule for a thousand years with Christ, what does that look like? You know, what, what will we do? What, uh, what kind of interactions will we have with the redeemed, with the born and Christians that have not yet received their glorified bodies, that make it through the rapture, that we will be judging and reigning with Christ as judges over Right? Have we ever actually stopped and, and thought about that? You know, after Jesus conquered death, after he was resurrected, the scriptures that he spent over a month talking with the disciples after his resurrection, expounding upon the kingdom, because he taught them the kingdom for over 30 days. The entire earth ministry of Jesus Christ, Jesus spent the time saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He mentioned the kingdom in his parables again and again and again, but there's not a lot to talk about the kingdom. And so if we don't understand how the kingdom operates, if we don't understand the kingdom that was created by God, uh, how do we hope to have greater intimacy with him? So that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit tonight. We're going to move through this quickly. We have the benefit of rewinding and listening to them again. So I'm going to move fast so that you guys can get this information and can listen as many times as possible in a very condensed version. We're going to start and talk about three things. What is the nature of our Heavenly Father? How the kingdom is an extension of his nature. And then application, how to engage the kingdom. So number one, um, what I hear, with a lot of correspondence that I get the people that reach out to me in the body of Christ, is is there more to this life than born-again religion? Is there life beyond despair and brokenness? Uh, Why, if I'm born again, if I have the Spirit of God in me, am I afraid? Am I scared? Am I looking for teachings that just distract me from my own pain and wounds? Is there more to this walk than just dying to the old man? 
is there more than just rejecting the religious system? And the answer to all those questions is, yeah, there's more. There's a lot more. See, guys, here's something I want to encourage you with, that we need to take an accurate inventory and accurately discern the times. God did not call us out of the religious institutional system without calling us into something. I'm going to say that again. God did not call us out of the religious institutional system without calling us to enter into something. We are called to come out of the satanic system and whatever that looks like, that satanic system is not a church building. Right? You can have that system in our thinking and anywhere where our thinking opposes how the kingdom operates, we're in bondage to Satan. He has called us out of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, the scriptures say. We have been, past tense, translated into the kingdom of his dear son. But if we are not operating according to the kingdom, if we are not aware of the kingdom we've been translated into, we're continuing to live under the bondage of Satan. That's why many of us that have been called out, that have come out of the system, Many of us that, that like to say and, and like to, to think and, and are and have our eyes open to what's wrong, we haven't entered into his rest because we haven't entered into cooperation with the kingdom of heaven. And the scriptures say that we have become citizens of heaven. Past tense. When we entered into the new covenant, when we received the Holy Spirit, when we were grafted into the new covenant that started on the day of Pentecost, we became citizens of heaven. So the first thing for us to understand about the kingdom of heaven is to understand that it is an extension of the nature of our heavenly father. So what we're going to do is spend a minute on talking about the nature of our heavenly father. First, we have to understand, guys, that everything that we interact with, everything the way we pray, the way we receive intuitive answers to prayer through uh, the Spirit of God in us, the way we interpret prophetic insight from the Lord, the way we interpret a prophecy that's given, the way we interpret prophetic understanding into the Word. Remember, prophecy is the heart, mind, and will of God revealed. That's all prophecy is. It is the heart, mind, and will of God revealed to the church so that we can enter into greater intimacy and cooperate with his plan. Everything we see and hear and every interaction we engage will be filtered through our perception of ourselves, who we believe we are, and who we believe Father God is. So let's start with who he truly is according to the scripture. First John 4, 8, guys, and we're going to start with the foundations here. We're going to start with the milk of the word and end with the meat. First John 4, 8. As God is love. Now, I'm going to destroy and hopefully in just a couple of sentences completely ab obliterate some false doctrine that has been going on floating around the body of Christ long enough. The first false doctrine I want to tear apart is the misconcept, the unbiblical teaching that we have to make a distinction between God is love and yet God is a holy God. That is a satanic, demonic doctrine that is pervasive in the body of Christ, that is forcing the body of Christ to schism along two extremes. It is not God is love, but God is also holy. There is no but there. Because God is not schizophrenic, guys. Our Heavenly Father, the creator of the universe, the Alpha and Omega, the one who is before the beginning of time and after the end of time, the creator of all good things, is not schizophrenic. He does not balance his nature between love and holiness. God is love. And holiness is one of many expressions in which love manifests. The reason why our attempts at being conformed into the image of God, which is what the word holy means. Holiness, guys, just so that we're talking the same language, 
When the Bible mentions the Greek or Hebrew word holiness, it means to be in the same nature of God. It's Strong's number 40, Greek hagios. It is to be set apart for God, holy, sacred, different, unlike, other than holy. In likeness or nature with the Lord. That is holiness. If we want to walk in greater likeness and oneness with the Lord, which is what holiness is, it's not our actions. It is to be in the same spiritual DNA makeup. If we wish to be conformed by the power of the Holy Spirit to transform our spiritual makeup and our emotional makeup, our soulish makeup, we have to embrace that God is love because love will manifest itself in our hearts. And one of the ways it manifests is holiness. If we attempt to do it the other way around, we become a Pharisee. And the spirit of Pharisee and the spirit of Antichrist are running rampant within the remnant in this generation. The spirit of Antichrist, guys, is anything that claims to profess Christ but denies the power of the gospel. So if we talk about how we profess Christ, but we deny the power of the Great Commission, we deny the power of the Holy Spirit to move through us, we deny, we defy um, the legitimate desire of him to give us insight into his mind, if we reject his intentions, we're agreeing with the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Pharisee, or legalism, is to say, I reject the institutional form of religion and yet to live outside of the kingdom of God. There's no gray. We're either in the kingdom in our thinking or out of the kingdom in our thinking. And Father God, in his immense love, guys, there's no shame in this, is calling us to return to his heart. He is not calling us to outward acts of conformity where we have the appearance of being like him in nature, but it's just because we're exercising self-control. That is not holiness, guys. That is a false doctrine. False doctrine number two, that holiness is equal to our actions. Our actions are a byproduct of one of two things, soulish control over our desires or us being transformed into his very nature so that the desires of our heart are one with his desires. That's the difference between true holiness and the spirit of Pharisee or false holiness. That's a lot of stuff. I know uh, we got to keep going, but I want you guys to please pray into that, digest that, get into the word on that. Um, there's no condemnation. Let's run through some scriptures, guys. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. But now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Guys, let's break down that, that famous scripture. Quote, we see it in Walmart, Kmart, we see it everywhere, right? Placards that are everywhere. The word faith means a personal trust in God. That's the word faith. The Greek word for faith means to have a personal trust in something. The word hope means to have a confident expectation of something yet to come. And the word love, in there, that used word, there's four Greek words for love. This Greek word for love is a manifestation of the nature of God. It is a verb. It's an action word. It is a manifest expression of the nature of God. So let's read this again. Now, now remember, 1 Corinthians 13, guys, is the entire chapter is Paul saying that love is everything. And no matter how deep our spiritual encounters, or no matter what we do outwardly that appears holy, if we are not manifesting the nature of God, If we are not manifesting love in our inner being, it's nothing. Please reread 1 Corinthians 13 with that in mind, what Paul is saying. He is absolutely opposing the outward false humility and false holiness movement of this generation. He is outwardly, overtly attacking the spirit of Pharisee and Antichrist. And God is once again raising up children who will walk in the same thing and in the manifest expression of his kingdom, and to do the works that Jesus did to glorify God and to express love through healing, through the gospel, through forgiveness. That's what he's doing in this hour. 
1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now, these three remain, a personal trust in Christ, a confident expectation of the things to come, and love, the very nature of God. But the greatest of these is love. Romans 13, 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. There is, guys, a law in the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is not anarchy. There is a law in heaven. There are courts in heaven. There are legal proceedings. There are war rooms. Um, there, I won't get into too much stuff, but look in the scriptures, guys. As we see the visitations that man has had into glimpses of parts of heaven, it is very well structured, and there is law. And every law, every ruling is grounded in love. It is not grounded in self-righteousness, condemnation, anger, and hurt. Wherever we are walking in condemnation, hurt, and self-righteousness, anger, we are lawbreakers to the kingdom of heaven. We are lawbreakers. Jesus very, made it very clear what will happen to lawbreakers on his return. The parable of the goat and sheep are addressing the lawbreakers who transgress the law of love. We read the parable of the goats and the sheep in Matthew, I think it's 25. It is not a pretty picture. And it will help to redirect our focus from being outwardly self-righteous to seeking his face and embracing how much he loves you. Again, there's no fear here, guys. You're not going to lose your salvation because you don't look like him very much or that I'm not going to lose mine if I don't manifest his nature very much. He's just calling for intimacy because he loves us. He is love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, does not dishonor, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, do everything in love. Guys, here's a distinction. It does not say do everything in self-control. Another false teaching. We think if we act in self-control, we're walking in love. That's a lie counterfeit. It is a counterfeit movement of the Holy Spirit. We are to do everything within the holiness of God's nature. God is love, and therefore holiness is to manifest love in every situation. So, do everything in the nature of God, in love. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Song of Solomon 8. Now, remember, Song of Solomon, guys, keep everything in context. You know that we're we're sticklers for proper biblical context. The Song of Solomon is a type and shadow of Jesus and the bridegroom. Bride and the bridegroom. Jesus and his bride. The Song of Solomon is a type and shadow of the marriage wedding, the feast. And in Song of Solomon 8, many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. If one were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly scorned. In that type and shadow, you read about the intense love that Jesus has for his church. It is pretty intense. Why? Because God is love. Proverbs 3, 3. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Bind what? Love and faithfulness. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Remember, all the scriptures are progressive revelation pointing to the new covenant. Proverbs is about wisdom and the principles of heaven. They explain the principles of the kingdom. And right here in Proverbs, with the principles that are never changing about God, the different covenants change, but the principles don't. And the principle here is love and faithfulness are to be bound around our neck and written upon our heart. Elsewhere in the prophecies, in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the prophets tell us how we're going to be equipped to do that. We will be equipped to do that through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why God says, I will give them a new heart and a new spirit and give them a new mind. That's the new covenant. No other covenant, whether it was the 
the Mosaic Covenant, Covenant of the Torah, which was to point them to Christ and the law of love, whether it was the, the Hebraic Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, the Noahic Covenant, the Adamic Covenant. Only in the New Covenant, which we live in now because we have the Holy Spirit in us, can we fulfill the mandate of Proverbs 3, 3, and 4. 1 John 4, 16, and so we know and rely on the love of God that he has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Ephesians 4, 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. John 15, 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider how we may spurn one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Guys, we live in those last times. We're in the end times. But how often are we tuning in to teachings and the word of God that is encouraging one another into love? How often are we hearing that? Romans 12, 10, be devout to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. 1 John 4, 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. His love is made complete in us if what? We love one another. Ephesians, uh, yeah, let's go Ephesians 5, 20. We'll finish up with this one. Guys, I could do this for hours, by the way. Genesis to Revelation. The Bible is a love story. It's a story of reconciliation written by an author who is love. And that love was manifested on the earth in the form of his son, who's the exact representation of his nature. Ephesians 5.21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, here's an interesting thought, guys. Here's an interesting question. Right? Now, I know for a lot of us here, these are New Testament scriptures. We're not familiar with them because we focus, many of us, on the old covenant, which is fulfilled in Christ. The new covenant has empowered us to move in love, and it is the love that allows us to enter into holiness or oneness with God. Satan has sold us a bill of lies and told us it's backwards. We have just become Pharisees of a different covering, of a different wrapper around us, a different bow. We've come out of the institutional church and we're trying to earn righteousness, self-righteousness, the same way that the Pharisees did during the time of Jesus. And the Lord's saying, nah, it's time. It's time to wipe away this deception. I love my children too much. No more fear. No more condemnation. No more worrying about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough problems of its own. It's time to live with me moment by moment in the garden of your heart through the power of the Spirit of God in you. Guys, he wants you to get to know him and the power of the resurrection that lives inside of you. Why would he say in Ephesians 5.21 to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ? That sounds kind of odd, right? How could us submitting to one another, how could us showing one another uh, submission be, be lifting up Christ? Well, because, guys, Christ is love manifested, and one of the ways that love manifests in addition to holiness and mercy and tenderheartedness, are all the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And one of those is reverence and submission. It's esteeming one another. That's living love. So when we are acting that way, we are showing honor and glorifying Christ because that's his nature. Jesus was obedient. He was reverent, submissive to the point of death. Because a lot of times we're not even submissive to the point of a different opinion, right? We, 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 we have a tough time many times even just submitting a difference in opinion. We're so quick to call everyone and each other and ourselves false. This shouldn't be, guys. We're better than this. We have the kingdom inside of us. And so if we want to begin to understand the kingdom, we don't have to look any further than understanding his heart. Everything comes becomes simple. You say, well, what does that mean, a license to sin, guys? I know, I know, I know. I said this again and again. I'm not interested in sinning. 
if anyone wants to talk about how much can we sin, you pick the wrong brother in Christ, because that's not me. I'm not interested in sinning, and I'm not interested in judging anyone else who sins. I'm interested in helping people grow in intimacy in Christ. That's my calling in the body of Christ. That's my place, is to point the way back to the power of the resurrected life. And it starts by us first rescuing those that are bound for hell. Those are the two ways love manifests. It manifests through sharing that the kingdom has come and through intimacy by being oneness in nature. That's an inward process. As we embrace how much he loves us, it will change our thinking. So we talked about the nature of God, guys. Um, we talked about how the kingdom is an extension of his nature. And, and the third thing is, is application. Guys, here's something I want to I encourage you with. We're going to talk more about this, but government. The word government, right, God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is governed. It is ruled. It is ruled by Jesus. The word government can be defined as the direction and control exercised over the actions of members, citizens, or inhabitants, or communities. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace governs the kingdom of heaven. If we are not walking in the nature of God, the love, the essence of God, and if one of the ways we're not walking in it, it's not being expressed in tremendous peace in our daily life, we've rejected Christ as the one who governs and stewards our souls. Jesus' government is upon his shoulders. He is the Prince of Peace. Now, for, for some of us that struggle, because, again, we just, it, here's what happens, guys. When we're hurt and wounded and scared, we're going to get into application and close this out. So I really want to keep this to a half hour. There's a lot to digest. The application here is to begin looking at where we want to see God as an angry God where we are so fearful that he loved us so much that Father sent Jesus to die for us and to be tortured for us while we hated him, the Bible says, while we were sinners, while we had nothing to do with him. Before we were even born, he saw you and died for you, sent Jesus for you. But yet we are so quick to think he is angry with us if we don't perform this checklist of super spiritual things. Guys, it's legalism. We just replaced the letter of the law with our own letter of Galatians. That we can earn his love, that we can earn the right to judge others. That is a bunch of garbage. And it's been going around since the first century. This isn't new. It's recycled garbage. And as the times get darker and darker, what we're going to begin to see are the children of God that shine all the more brightly are those that walk in intimacy. Because the darker a room gets, the same light shines brighter and brighter in our eyes. You are each, every person hearing my voice, are called to enter into being the light of the world and a lamp on top of a hill. We do not hide our lamp under a bowl. The way that our light gets hidden is by us agreeing in our thinking with Satan's lies. And number one, you guys have heard me speak for three years. We are the righteousness of Christ. We cannot earn. We cannot earn holiness. Remember Romans 3.22 and a slew of others, but let's start with 3.22. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testified, meaning they pointed to Christ, guys. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Hebrews 10.10, by which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus' once and for all atonement made you sanctified. The scriptures do not say here, by which we are all sanctified through the offering of our own self-righteous works. That's false doctrine, guys. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Colossians 1.21 says, 
We have become the righteousness of God. We've been presented holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That is called positional righteousness. If we choose to live to sin, well, we're going to reap the benefits of it. If we sow to sin, we're going to reap it. If we sow to, to a drug habit or we sow to alcohol, well, our, our kidneys are going to break down. Our organs are going to break down. That doesn't mean God stops loving us. It doesn't mean he is wringing his hands, can't wait, licking his chops to send us to hell. Guys, that's the pit of hell. If you're hearing those teachings, in the name of Jesus Christ, by the authority given to me as an elder in this generation, I say to stop listening to those teachings. They are the teachings of demons. God has called you and paid the highest price. He sacrificed his own family to have intimacy with you. He loves you. What we have to first do is start asking him, give him permission. Heavenly Father, I give you permission. Let your Holy Spirit shine on my thinking. In what areas have I been wounded and hurt and damaged and made to believe the lies that my self-worth can go up or down in your eyes? Guys, we have been translated into a new kingdom. We've been given a new identity. A new identity. Scripture say 2 Corinthians 5.17, behold, all things have become new in Christ. We need to be fearless enough and brave enough to begin to say, you know what? What I've been believing is a lie and trust that he is faithful to guide you on this journey. Accepting Jesus as your atonement is not the end. It's the beginning of a journey of entering into intimacy with him, not legalism. Not fear, not the condemnation, thinking he's just waiting to club you. He used to love you, but now he expects a lot more of you, and you're falling short, so now he's angry with you. Guys that are schizophrenic, demonic lies speaking to the church. It doesn't produce any life. That's why there's so few accounts of legitimate healings, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. The things the church moved in the first century is because they moved in their identity. They knew they were completely and unconditionally loved. They received that love. It transformed them by the renewing of their minds, Romans 12, 2. And then they went ahead and they just let the kingdom of heaven flow out from within them. So where the fruits are, they will show us what, where we're living, guys. And there's no condemnation. It's a clarion call for us to pick up Christ. We entered into his death. It's time to live in him. The Bible doesn't say we entered into his death and burial. It says death, burial, and resurrection. I have died, been crucified, and raised up with Christ, Paul says in Romans 6, Romans 8. The entire book of Romans is about living in Christ, not just dying with him. Right? Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So... What we need to do is look at our belief system, start giving the Holy Spirit permission. Lord, what's on your heart right now? What areas do I have hurt and fear and judgment leaning over me, thinking that you are displeased with me? What areas has Satan kept me in bondage? I choose to receive your life. God's my website has entire sections of scriptures that meditate on who we are in Christ, how we died to the old man, how God has given us a new identity. It's a gift. Our identity in Christ is a gift. What we received when we accepted Jesus as our atonement, guys, was not salvation. It was righteousness. Salvation is a byproduct. That's another false teaching going around. We've been, we've been saved, but, but we have to work out our righteousness. It doesn't say that. It says work out your salvation, meaning the context of that scripture, guys, is work out your relationship. Work out the kind of intimacy you have because we know it's unbiblical that you can earn salvation. So when we say work out our salvation, if I was to say, guys, someone says, David, how's your marriage going? Ah, well, we're working things out. We're working out our marriage. Does that mean I'm not married? Does that mean I lost my marriage? No, it means I'm working things out. In the same way, the salvation is the same way. It's our walk with God. Guys, we received righteousness. We've been made blameless. 
That is why we're not going to hell. Salvation is to be, is to be saved. We are saved because we have been made blameless in the eyes of the Father. If we think we can't go to him because of our actions, we have rejected the very thing that gives us salvation. So we just gotta we just gotta cut loose those lies. He's raising up an end times army, guys. He's raising up a bunch of people that move in great love and power and spend the day with him, hear his voice, move and rest. It's taking place all over the world in this hour. The persecuted church has been persecuted since A.D. 100. Is raising up again in the midst of persecution, in the midst of being tortured. They are digging into Christ. The United States is lagging behind. And I know I have a good handful of people that listen to me abroad. I say to you guys, hang in there. You're doing awesome. Father God's talking to me a lot about you guys. He sees you. He sees your love that you're allowing to transform him. And to those that are stateside with me, to those that are in Canada, Mexico, I say, guys, pick up the desire of his heart. Run with it. Press on to the goal of knowing Christ. Paul said, I desire that I may know him. This is Paul the Apostle. Guys, this is exciting times. There is so much grace and power being poured out in the body of Christ in this hour. There is so much unmerited grace, the very definition of grace, unmerited favor being poured out in this hour. He wants to speak to you in dreams and visions. He wants to train you on how to hear his voice. He wants to train you that when you go into a supermarket, he just speaks to you about a stranger, and you can lay hands upon them and pray over them. He wants to teach you how to do that with wisdom and without looking weird. Above all, he wants you to know that you are unconditionally loved and your value comes from him. So that even if you did look silly in someone's eyes, you don't care. He has so much he wants to do with us. So we're going to wrap this up. The calling, the admonition that I have for my dear brothers and sisters tuned in tonight is understanding his government is a key to intimacy. It starts with understanding his nature and that the kingdom is an extension of his nature, and that Jesus is the governor, the government of the kingdom, the rules of the kingdom flow from Jesus, who is love, and is the exact representation of Father. And the application is we need to give him permission when we think, when we feel, trace it back to our thoughts and our beliefs, root out those lies by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he will transform you. Romans 12, 2 says, I will be transformed by the renewing of my mind. So, um, I hope this is a blessing. We'll close this out. We're going to talk about it really in two weeks. We're going to continue on part three on a deeper communion. And, guys, we are going to move from the basics and the milk of the word to the deep things of God, the deep teachings of what great intimacy looks like, what it looks like to walk this earth the way the first century did. Who are just getting started. That is, your, that is your spiritual birthright, guys, is to move in the spirit, to live in the kingdom, to hear his voice, to feel the presence, the manifest presence of the kingdom of heaven that has come to destroy the works of the devil. So praise God. I hope this is a, was a, a blessing to you guys. And I kept it just under 40 minutes, a little bit over, but, uh, but it was worth it. Dorothy, anything to add before we close out? No, I'm good. I just think it, you're doing very well because this is one of the areas where we sabotage ourselves in our walk. So this is an important lesson to get under our belt. Yeah, and, and Father's putting an end to it. The power of the Holy Spirit is moving in the end times. You know, the scriptures, the prophecies of the Old Testament, guys, we're going to close up with this. It says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, a flood, prophesying of the end times demonic horde that were coming, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against him. Right? We don't hear that prophecy spoken very much. 
But in these end times, the darker things get, the more the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to be freely magnified over the body of Christ. And all we have to do is be willing to open it, be willing to step into it. It starts with our mind. So, guys, um, we're going to continue to talk on this. We're going to continue to, to dig into this. It's just a good thing. It's a really good thing. And, and for those of you that want that, um, you know what? Let me see if I can find out a few scripture, guys. When the enemy comes in like a flood. I think it's in Isaiah 59, but I'm not sure. Hold on. Isaiah 59, 19. God is raising up a stand in these end times to absolutely obliterate and set free those who are under the deception of the enemy. But first, guys, that starts with the church. God is calling his church. He's setting his church in order. He is redeeming his church to be the pure and spotless bride. Jesus says, when I come, will there be faith, a personal trust in the kingdom? And that's what he's doing in this hour, guys. So God bless you. Know that you are unconditionally loved. Have the courage by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name to receive it. And we will see you again in two weeks' time. God bless you. Dorothy, have a wonderful night. God bless body of Christ. Father bless. This has been Zeal Fear House. I'm David Murray, and I'm joined with Dorothy Carruthers. We were hope that you were blessed by this week's broadcast. Again, if this was your first time, please stop by my website at www.dwmurray.com. That's D-W-M-U-R-R-Y dot com for additional teachings and insights. God bless you, and until next time, please dare to accept the fact that your heavenly dad loves you deeply.